I think it, it's straightforward to say we've gone from something exceptionally common to something that's a little bit rarer. It's not to say that we won't confront it. And as you know, if you look at the literature in terms of managing and looking after patients with, say, leg ulcers, that at least 5 to 10 percent of individuals will have something that's dermatologically driven uh, that's slightly different from your conventional types of ulceration. And wounds elsewhere, too. It's important to understand and recognize these. And pyoderma gangrenosum is one of those characteristic ones. It's the one where you most worry about because additional trauma will make the disease worse. And so here we have a condition that's relatively rare. And so how do you get the evidence to support any one treatment? If you were to go to the literature and you sort of did a PubMed search, you'll find the latest fad. But you'll also see that people have used lots of other things before they do the latest fad. And so it's hard to, to distill down to what is the first line treatment or how you should go about approaching it. And this is the thing that's faced dermatology a long, for a long time. We have about 3,000 diseases, 4,000, some people say, that we try and manage, and many of them are rare, and as a consequence, getting the evidence base to say, look, when you see somebody, uh, in, as I do in Carmarthen, what am I going to do that's going to be along the official guideline? To do this, uh, we have a collaborative group established via the Nottingham uh, group, in, in, well, obviously in Nottingham, and what they did was they got funding in from the, the HTA, and they established a large trial. Dermatologists are, by and large, very sociable creatures, and so it was able to be able to collect all the cases of pyoderma gangrenosum, a lot of cases of pyoderma gangrenosum, and collaboratively come up with the evidence to support one treatment or another. As you can imagine, when you do such a thing, you have to start with the basic type of treatment, and you have to sort of see that we can only answer a very simple question. Uh, but as you can say, the power is in the numbers, and the numbers allow us to be able to make a definitive statement. And therefore, I think this study, uh, which I was a collaborator in, wasn't the driving force, it was the Nottingham Group, uh, is an immense step forward in providing evidence, making sure that our patients are getting the best care possible for what is otherwise a relatively rare condition, but one that puts the jeepers up you when it's sat there in front of you in clinic. So here we have a rare, what we call necrotizing condition, in which your own body is starting to attack the skin tissue and break it down. And there was weak evidence for a lot of treatments. And the first line therapy, by the thing that we should go through first, hadn't been defined. And there were two treatments that most people were using, either prednisolone or cyclosporin. And so a randomized co uh, controlled trial was established. We had health economics data because we were able to make the most of these individuals. And we did a cohort study of topical treatments uh, as an add-on uh, to the study. And we worked out what was best for our patients in terms of healing them. And so it was a relatively pragmatic study. It wanted to show superiority. And we had adults only in the study. And they were stratified one to one. The study itself is published in the BMJ, so it's easily accessible. But really, it's the, the, the feelings that I want to convey to you of, of why this was an important bit. And it's the images that were stratified. So again, like I said, you've got people throughout the country uh, both north and west, all the way to Scotland, all the way to West Wales, where we were recruiting, uh, measuring people. So they couldn't go to a single center. So we had to use photographs and the now that the consultant dermatologist who was in the study was making the correct diagnosis. And the area was measured as a way of stratifying patients and assessing response. There were two outcomes. Uh, the main outcome was the speed at which you heal, which drug was going to do it fastest, and hence would become the first line therapy. And then the secondary outcomes were time to healing, uh, the quality of life, how did the patient fare with that treatment, what were the adverse events. Yes, you may have something that works exceptionally well, but clearly has toxicity associated, and that would be something that you'd want to identify. And it was intent to treat analysis, i.e. everybody was included in the data. And so uh, the graph illustrates uh, the collective, collaborative effort of lots of dermatologists accruing 500 patients into this study. 
Of those, 128 were randomized into either cyclosporin or prednisolone. And what you can see is that roughly even numbers were uh, able to achieve the primary outcome. Uh, and uh, so we were able to be able to use the data. It wasn't one of those studies that died a death. We were able to use the data to give you the definitive answer. Uh, these are 39 UK hospitals, three and a half years worth of work, all put together in a short presentation for you. Uh, and so the findings relate to 108 of these. Uh, at week six, we had the mean standard deviation, uh, so mean and the standard deviation to the speed of healing for the uh, cyclosporin. And what we saw that cyclosporin healed the wound slightly faster, not a lot, than prednisolone. And that uh, at six months, 47% uh, of the ulcers had healed, suggesting that you can have a cohort that goes on quite a long time. You're now worried about how long you're going to leave these patients on the treatment uh, and all the potential complications of both therapies. Uh, and their adverse reactions reciprocate that. And what you find is that they're in the range of two-thirds of individuals had problems with the two therapies. They're not perfect, even though we often use them. Uh, and there, there was a recurrence rate of about a third in both groups. And really, there wasn't that much of a difference. There wasn't much that you can tell apart between the two treatments itself over a period of that six months, as I was saying. And so, well, could we say anything about the secondary outcomes? Was one better than the other in terms of either pain or whether the patient felt better or worse? And the answer is relatively no. So you could choose now, based on this evidence, either of these therapies. And so there is a clear commentary, and as I said, the, the study itself has been published, uh, and so uh, one would argue that you can use cyclosporin or prednisolone as first-line therapy for this condition, pyoderma gangrenosa. So does the response at six weeks predict outcome? So remember we said uh, that only half of the patients actually healed. So how do you know when to switch? Yes, we're saying you've already got a medium time follow-up of up to six months before you get to half. Well, you can't wait six months to say, by the way, Mrs. Jones, as I do, uh, you're sorry, uh, we've done our six months, we're now time to switch. Can we get any idea that things aren't working earlier? And a powered study like this allows us to do that. There are values and merits in this. And so uh, are the following measures useful, speed of healing, the investigator's assessment, I mean, are we feeling better today? Uh, and the resolution of inflammation, is it less red around the edge? And in essence, what we can see is that uh, the rate of healing uh, and the uh, key parameter is whether the person looking at the wound felt that there was evidence that there was healing going on was the best predictor. It's close. There's no great gap between them, but that was the idea. So it's six weeks of objective assessment by yourselves. Looking at the wound, you can tell whether or not the drug is going to be effective. So in conclusion, the investigator global assessment of the wound at six weeks was predictive of whether or not the patient was going to heal at six months. And there is no real magic that we can apply to that at the moment, that we have no biomarkers, we have no other way of looking at it, but at least we know that this is one way of doing it. And at six weeks, if you don't see evidence of healing, then maybe it's time to switch to a second line therapy. So uh, conducted alongside the main randomized control trial was a second part, which is to say that, okay, dermatologists, you strange bunch of people, uh, we know that you use an awful lot of things, and sometimes you don't give patients tablets to treat their pyoderma gangrenosum, and you just use topical corticosteroids. So does that really work? Why aren't you going and using our evidence-based now first-line treatment, and can we build that in? So there were 60 patients or so 
who were followed up along to see whether topical therapies alone could help uh, a healing. Of the topical therapies, uh, there were two. Uh, they're right at the bottom there. Uh, one was clobetazole propionate, that's dermavate to you and I, and the other one is tacrolimus or protopic. What are they? Well, obviously, they're almost reciprocal in their topical nature to the tablets that we were studying. Yes, clobetazole propionate is a strong steroid, yes, so that, that's uh, a, a glucocorticosteroid, whereas tacrolimus is of the family of cyclosporin, a calcium urine inhibitor, and because originally dermatologists were desperate to try and cram the cyclosporin molecule into a tube, we like trying to cram these big molecules into the tube, but never could physically do it because the actual molecule was too large to penetrate through the skin surface, along came the Japanese with a fantastic new drug called tacrolimus, and that tacrolimus, which we often see now on our renal transplant wards, it was, being, it was small enough to be incorporated into an ointment. And so you can use this as an alternative topical therapy. The advantages, of course, were that it was a non-steroid. And so uh, the study found that there was a really uh, a relatively rapid uh, rate of healing with these topical therapies. The wounds themselves were smaller. Uh, I think you have to accept that this is not a surrogate for your tablet-based therapy. There is a subgroup of pyoderma gangrenosum that is treated topically uh, because it is much less aggressive. Uh, and that at six months, again, half of the patients healed, uh, and the time to healing completely can take up to 169 days. Sorry. And so, uh, again, there was no real difference, uh, although you might say, uh, that, yeah, there was no real difference between the two different preparations. And uh, here again, we see the same phenotype or the same picture in terms of healing rates between dermavate and uh, other topical treatments or tacrolimus uh, as we did before. So in conclusion, topical therapies are potentially effective for a subgroup of pyoderma gangrenosum in which you don't have the significant depth of invasion that you do with classical pyoderma gangrenosum. In classical pyoderma gangrenosum, most of us would say that you need to have systemic therapies, and again, like I said at the beginning, the evidence supports either cyclosporin or oral prednisolone. But for superficial pyoderma gangrenosum that, that hasn't invaded deep and left you with a big ulcer, then you may try topical therapies. They heal at the roughly the same rate, obviously without the same degree of adverse effects. And uh, here uh, you can choose either topical dermavate or topical clobetazole propionate as it's called, or topical tacrolimus, alternatively known as protopic. Uh, and it remains clear, unclear, whether a more severe type of disease will respond because the study was never geared to go and answer that. And I don't think we would ever be able to go and say to somebody with classical deep pyoderma gangrenosum, I'm sorry, we're going to do the topicals alone. In my case, often I throw an awful lot of things at these patients. They are a particularly desperate group of patients to manage. Uh, the funding, as I said, uh, was NIHR uh, through the HTA, uh, and really, if it wasn't for a national UK funding body stepping in to say we will help address these issues, we would never be at this stage in terms of having the data. We would be stuck at having odd case reports, small series, and never an, a definitive way of saying one or the other. And yes, whilst we may have hoped one or other therapy may have proven beneficial over the other, as in you're putting your academic hat on, maybe as the actual practicing physicians or clinicians or, or carers in the room, then you don't really care. You've got two things you can choose for, and from that you can decide what is best for your patient without feeling guilty that you may be doing them harm or choosing the inferior treatment, even though that might be the right therapy for them. Just a quick word, since I've still got a green light uh, and I've got a few minutes. Pyoderma gangrenosum is potentially the devastating disease in a wound healing clinic, in any form of wound healing. It is a one in which your body, uh, through uh, becoming sensitized, starts to develop its own inflammatory reaction in which your own immune system starts to target it. 
It does so with the obnoxious cell, which is usually obnoxious to bacteria, the, the neutrophil, which migrates directly under the skin and gives you the classical appearance of a boil or a, bl uh, a, boil or a pustule. And that's how it starts. Then it breaks down, and unfortunately, that then triggers progression of it as it moves it outwards. That's what gives you that overhanging red edge, because like any boil that you may have lanced, you'll always have that overhanging edge at the ends, and it's that that you're looking for when you're making that diagnosis. The redness at the edge is what gives you a clear clue that there is inflammation driving this wound and not a central vascular problem, as you may look for in a leg ulcer uh, from typical causes. Unless you switch that off, it is bad. Do not ever let them go near a surgeon because debridement is bad. Again, you stimulate that neutrophilic infiltrate, which is already upgeared, and that starts to break down the tissue even more. So with those words of caution, use either cyclosporin or prednisolone early, and then if you have something superficial, think about topical tracrolimus or topical dermavane. Thank you.